Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to another Intensive Care at Home and Intensive Care Hotline live stream. I'll just to begin with start typing in the numbers. You can dial in live on the show here um, if you like. I'll just type in the numbers. And then we can get started. If you want to dial in live on the show with your questions, please. Um, you can dial in or type your questions into the chat pad. Okay, let's get started. Today's topic for intensive care at home and intensive care hotline is trying to get intensive care at home with ventilation, tracheostomy and dialysis. So it's uh, for my mom. It's a question we get all the time. And I want to, you know, want to highlight today how you can get that for your mom um, and get her home. Now, before I go more into today's topic, I quickly want to talk about, um, you know, what makes me qualified to talk about these topics, anything intensive care related and intensive care at home related. So my name is Patrick Hutzel. I'm a critical care nurse by background. I have been working in intensive care slash critical care for over 20 years in three different countries. I am the founder of intensivecareathome.com where we are providing home care nursing, intensive home care nursing for predominantly long-term ventilated adults and children with tracheostomies and otherwise medically complex uh, patients that are in need of intensive care nurses at home. Um, and during my time in intensive care, uh, I have also worked as a nurse unit manager for over five years. And um, yeah, I, you know, I can talk about intensive care all day long. I can talk about intensive care at home all day long. I'm also the founder of intensivecarehotline.com where we provide a consulting and advocacy service for families in intensive care. We help families in intensive care all around the world. Uh, with intensive care at home, before I answer today's question, we are uh, currently operating in Australia, in all major capital cities, and uh, where we have a number of intensive, highly skilled intensive care nurses working with our clients at home. We employ hundreds of years of intensive care nursing experience. Um, and as far as I'm aware, we are the only company in the English speaking world that um, has that area of expertise in the community. And there is no other organization, as far as I'm aware, that has achieved third party accreditation for intensive care at home. And uh, we are in a position to take patients home from intensive care directly. So that's a little bit about, you know, what uh, gets me to this point to do this broadcast today, to do this live show. Um, bit of housekeeping. You can type your questions into the chat pad or you can dial in the show. I've typed the number numbers in the chat pad here. Uh, you can dial me directly and you get me on the phone right here and there. And you can get on the show and answer, um, get your questions answered here. Okay, so let's get started with today's topic. Um, trying to get intensive care at home for my mum with ventilation, tracheostomy and dialysis. And we had an email from a reader um, who was um, writing us in with her situation, with her mum in ICU, and she's been in ICU for three months. She can't come off the ventilator. She's got dialysis needs, and can she take her mother home? And the short answer is yes, of course. This is something we're absolutely capable of providing to, um, to our client. 
you know. And how is it going to be set up? Well, similar to an intensive care bed, we are sending the intensive care nurses to your home and provide a 24 hour roster so that your mom <coughs> finally can leave ICU. Because, you know, you're saying in your email that she doesn't have any quality of life. You know, she's depressed and she can't wean off the ventilator, you know. And how can this be funded? You know, for example, if you're here in Australia, most of the clients are funded through the NDIS, through the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, and if you are looking after funding in particular, you should uh, contact us, of course, and then we can map out the next steps for you and with you um, how to get on the NDIS scheme. But in some situations, you know, you might have other funding sources available, such as, you know, maybe the Department of Veteran Affairs, maybe it's, it's um, you know, uh, through an accident, then you might have an accident scheme stepping in. So it really depends a little bit on where you're coming from in terms of what led you to this situation. Sometimes it's hospitals that are happy to fund because it's again what we are providing is a win-win situation. You want your mom home, your mom wants to be at home of course. The hospital wants a free bed, right? So the hospital might have an interest in paying for it, departments of health might have an interest in paying for it, right? Private health funds of course have an interest in paying for it because um, again they cut the cost or we are cutting the cost of an intensive care bed by around 50%. Again, it's all about uh, providing that win-win situation for everyone. But in terms of your mother, how can she go home efficiently, you know, once the funding is there, we start hiring ICU nurses or, you know, depending on your location, we send you some of our nurses that are on our books already and we would especially, you know, especially when we take clients home for the first time, you know, we, we have some of our senior nurses leading that, you know, because we've done many transitions home and you need, uh, you know, you need the specialists to make that happen. You know, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. You know, what do I mean by that? Of course, we need to focus on uh, getting the right team for you and for your family. You know, you want nurses coming to your home that are enthusiastic, that want to work with you, you know, that want, that live and breathe our vision and mission, which is to keep patients out of intensive care, you know, and it needs to be the right fit for you and your family, you know. And then how we go from there is we've got to organize the right equipment, we've got to organize ventilators, you know, spare tracheostomies, tracheostomy dilator, resuscitation bag, you know, equipment for the PEG, equipment for the dialysis, of course, spare ventilator, spare suction machine monitoring, you know, all the documentation that needs to go in there. You probably need uh, a hospital bed. You probably need a hoist to begin with until you can have a ceiling hoist or a lifting machine. So there's a number of things that need to be uh, that need to get ready but um, you know that's all something that can be organized from our end and then we also need to look at you know who's the overseeing medical body or medic medical where's the medical governance coming from sometimes it's coming from the hospital sometimes it might even come from your GP it can come from a respiratory doctor so there's a number of avenues again that we can show you and we can point you towards so that we can set it up properly you know so that also leads me what are the goal what are the goals you know i mean you need to show us what what are your mom's goals what does she want at home you know she probably wants to spend time with family i guess the major goal for now the short-term goal is to get out of icu as quickly as possible that is the major goal and um and then once your mom is at home, then we can look at things like, okay, how, what does she want to do on a day by day basis? You know, where does she want to spend her time? Does she want to spend her time only at home? Are there avenues for her to go out? You know, most of our clients go out during the day. So this is contrasting an ICU bed where people think, well, that person won't have any quality of life with what's possible at home. 
you know, people live their lives. They're very busy living their lives. They're going out. You know, they have friends, families coming over, uh, which, you know, is very limited in ICU. So real improvement in quality of life, some instances quality of end of life. But, you know, where do people want to be and what needs to happen to make it happen? You know, so that's what we are here to do, really. Um, and then once your mom is at home, once we've got a stable team, you know, when, when we hire nurses for you, we usually go through staff introductions. You know, we try to um, set, uh, um, set up meet, meet and greet, meet and greets with you and your family to make sure we've got the right fit for you. You know, we try and introduce the staff, do some shadow shifts or some introduction shifts, you know, once we've got a few staff there. Uh, we've all done it before and we can do the same for you. I know it's, it sounds reasonably simple and it is simple. You know, we, we just got to really find the right stuff for you. We know what to do with equipment, you know, and then we just continue the intensive care in the home. You know, it's no big deal really um, to put that in place. So um, let me know your questions, type them in the chat pad or call in live if you want to, uh, with any questions around the topic, you know. Other things that we can organize, you know, or that need to be organized in a situation like that is, you know, nutrition, you know, your mom's got a peg tube, you know, we need to organize nutrition, okay. so. Again, that can all be organized. Other things that need to be organized are um, things such as, you know, an OT, physical physiotherapy, you know, but again, we can help you with our network with uh, setting that up. And also just, you know, when I say we are sending intensive care nurses in the home, they have the same quality than the nurses in intensive care with the difference most of them have home care experience. And, you know, there is a difference between an intensive care nurse that has only ever worked in ICU and an intensive care nurse that has worked in ICU and in home care. It's a much more sensitive environment in, in a home care because everything is really driven by the client and by the family. And our intensive care nurses, we believe that we have employed, uh, understand the difference between an ICU and home care environment where, um, you know, we need to be sensitive to your requirements, to your requests, to how you want, how do you want care to look like? You know, how do you want uh, your days to look like? How do you want your nights to look like? You know, how do you want to have the shift times? You know, um, the devil is in the detail. You know, when should we be doing the tracheostomy changes, are they, be, are they being done at home? Do they need to be done in a hospital? You know, we can do them at home, but there are some rare situations when you need to do the tracheostomy changes in a hospital, you know. What else needs to happen? Does, does your mom need regular nebulizers? How often do we change the inner tubes or inner cannulas? Right, so number of things that need to happen but again we have done it many times and we can adapt to your mum's situation so okay so and i know your mum is obviously has been in icu now for three months and i know she's you know for lack of a better term desperate to go home i can totally understand that after three months in icu she would be so fed up by the environment, no natural daylight, you know, it's noisy 24 hours a day. That's another thing, you know, once your mom is at home uh, in a family environment, it's so much quieter, it's so much nicer. You know, um, patients in ICU often have a disturbed day and night rhythm because of the environment, whereas at home, you know, it's, it's important to get back into a natural day and night rhythm you know, really important. Okay, 
If there are no other questions in regards to whether ventilation, tracheostomy and dialysis is possible at home, um, you know, if there are no other questions, then I want to move on and start answering some other questions that we had this week, that we had coming in this week. But in the meantime, if you have any other questions to today's topic, um, just type them in or call in on the numbers that I've just uh, sent there in the chat pad. Okay, let me just answer some other questions that came through this week. I just need to bring them up on my phone. Um, just give me a second. Okay, so questions that came in this week. Okay, when someone is in a coma being fed with a feeding tube and the patient has a UTI plus pneumonia, could the sugar in the feeding tube add to the infection? What about probiotics after having been on antibiotics for months? Couldn't it help? Could it help causing the UTI and pneumonia? Okay, I'll read that again. When someone is in an induced coma being fed with a feeding tube and the patient has a UTI plus a pneumonia, could the sugar in a feeding tube add to the infection? Um, Look, it's been shown that not feeding in ICU is to the detriment of a patient. Okay, so you need to start feeding early in ICU because if you're not, the gut flora gets out of uh, their normal out of the normal pH range, and it could cause gastric ulcers or could potentially go, cause a GI or a gastric bleed. So not feeding um, would be detrimental for the patient and it would be detrimental for the long-term outcome of a patient, for the long-term outcome of your loved one. So, um, so the answer to the first part of the question is uh, you need to start feeding. Could the sugar in the feeding tube add to the infection? I kind of doubt it. Um, I kind of doubt it. You know, if someone has a UTI and has a pneumonia, well, a UTI is often is often a result of having a catheter in, a Foley catheter in the bladder. So, you know, that's not the only reason, but that can be a reason. Could also be a reason, could be immunocompromised. You know, there could be other reasons for a UTI. Um, you know, may, hygienic reasons, hygiene reasons, you know, there could be a number of uh, reasons. A pneumonia is generally speaking caused by, you know, by an airway infection, chest infection, traveling all the way down into the lungs. So therefore, again, it's unlikely that the sugar in the feeding tube will add on to the um, uh, infection. Second part of your question, what about probiotics after having been on antibiotics for months? Couldn't, couldn't it help causing the UTI and pneumonia? This is probably more of a question that you know you need to discuss with the um, with your dietitian. So your loved one in ICU must have a dietitian, and uh, this is probably a question that should be asked, uh, should be answered by the dietitian that your loved one is um, having in ICU. So I hope that helps um, with that question. The next question that we had this week was, my son's been in ICU from, my son's been in ICU in the induced coma since the 20th of November, 2022. He has a tracheostomy in place. The doctors claim his blood gas levels are not allowing him to breathe on his own. And then the second part of the question is, I'm praying my son comes off that ventilator. His injury was supposedly aspiration pneumonia. The pneumonia is gone, but the lung is scarred, has a blood clot now, as per the doctor's report. I'm so grateful that he survived to this point. Will he survive any further? That is a, a good question to ask. Now let's just start with the 
first question. So it's been in a coma since the 20th of November 2022. Uh, by me reading out this email today is the, 20, is the 15th of January. Um, so that's nearly two months. That's a long time. Um, if his blood gas levels are not allowing him to breathe on his own, um, then there is a significant respiratory issue and you need to find out what it is. Is it a pneumonia? Is it um, sleep apnea? Is it, you know, um, is he asthmatic? Does he have COPD? You know, you need to find out what's causing it. You know, if it's a pneumonia, for example, they probably need to find out, is it a bacterial pneumonia? Is it a viral pneumonia? Is it a fungal pneumonia? And then treat it accordingly. Right. Um, initially, obviously, he had an aspiration pneumonia. And if the lungs are scarred and he has a blood clot now, that is definitely a inhibitor to get him off the ventilator. So if he's got scar tissue in the lungs, like with any other scar, it's irreversible, you know. And that will be very challenging for your son to come off the ventilator if it's irreversible. Um, if it's an irreversible... If it's, if it's scar tissue, you know, also known as lung fibrosis. Now, you haven't shared how old your son is, but, you know, one next step might be, you know, if he's got scar tissue, it'll be difficult to get off the ventilator, right? That probably brings me back to our first question today, is tracheostomy ventilation and dialysis possible at home? I think that might be a question you want to ask in this situation too whether your son might be a candidate for going home if he can't be weaned off the ventilator with scar tissue. You haven't shared how old your son is, but another avenue for your son might be to have a lung transplant. So it depends on his overall condition, you know, how old he is. And uh, it's definitely a question you should be asking and maybe you haven't even, you haven't even considered that as an option. You're also saying that he's got a blood clot now. I'm not sure whether you are referring to a pulmonary embolus um, or what you're referring to. It would be good if you could write in about that. So um, I hope that answers that question. Then the next question that we've had this week is from John. And John said, being told that our family member is, he puts that in quote, staying the same, no improvement on the ventilator, but cognitive mental status is improving, and the ICU palliative care team are pushing to consider medical intervention as well as turning off the ventilator. So this is something, unfortunately, we see all the time where things apparently are improving, um, but the ICU is pushing for end of life. Now, if... John, your family member's uh, cognitive and mental status is improving in particular, then my recommendation is to look for getting to the point where your family member can make up their own mind what they want. Surely that if they wake up, they would say that they don't want to die. I think you need to get to that point to get the palliative care team off your back and the ICU team off your back, you know. This week in particular, we've had so many situations with clients where um, ICU teams were quite frankly pushing for end of life and not in a nice way. And, um, you know, we were able to recommend some treatment options. Um, we were able to rec recommend and, and uh, also advocate for our clients to keep going with life support on religious grounds on cultural grounds, you know, not every culture or every religion is saying it's okay in my religion to just stop life support. In my religion, I believe that we should keep going until the very end. And one has to respect that. Um, the reality is that, um, you know, patients' wishes need to be respected. You know, families' wishes need to be respected in the absence of an advanced care directive, right? 
uh, it's it always boggles me and it still boggles me how quick that ICUs are to push for end of life. You know, they need the beds, we know that, you know, and they think that if the patient was, a, was to survive, that there's quote unquote, uh, no quality of life. Well, you've just heard me talk about intensive care at home. There's definitely quality of life at home with the right support structure, with the right mindset, with the right people, you know. So I am still shocked in how quickly ICUs are trying to withdraw life support in certain situations. So, but in your situation, John, um, you simply need to push back and you need to say what you want for your family member. As a, as a side note here, when anyone, this is for any of you watching this, if you have a loved one in intensive care, you should be making very clear from day one when you are coming into intensive care what you would like. You know, I understand the challenge here. The challenge is no one sitting at home doing research and thinking, oh, what if my family member goes into ICU next week? What question should I be asking? No one is sitting at home wondering that, you know, no one's doing the research. And when you are then confronted with the situation, like when your loved one is going into ICU, you don't know where to start. You have no idea what to expect. You have no idea that the machinery that is intensive care can be quite ruthless. And if you're not prepared for it, you almost stand no chance in uh, getting what you want. You know, unfortunately, you can't just presume that the ICU will do whatever is necessary and whatever is really in your loved one's best interest. You can't just automatically assume that. You know, what you must assume is that ICUs are running a business and you must assume that ICUs will try and manage budgets, will try and manage staff, beds, equipment and so forth. That's what you must assume, right? And all the communication that's coming from an intensive care team is really all around that. You know, it's about priorities. And sometimes, unfortunately, your loved one is not a priority. Case in point, this week we were working with a family who had their 48 year old dad slash husband in ICU after cardiac arrest and supposedly hypoxic brain injury. And clearly the gentleman was deteriorating uh, and his CO2 was rising and the ICU did not change the ventilation settings to get CO2 down saying that it was quote unquote not in his best interest to survive, right? Um, I'm a big believer that, you know, every patient in ICU needs to be given a chance. And if they do survive, you know, then you need to look at other options, you know, again, such as intensive care at home, for example, you know, um, so there's a number of things that can be done. And again, you know, you need to think ahead and you need to get someone on site who can ask all the right clinical questions, who knows what's to come next, who can manage intensive care teams because most families in RC have no idea how to manage intensive care teams, you know. So coming back to this 48 year old man, they didn't change the ventilator settings to get his CO2 down, then he dropped his blood pressure. Um, and after the family put some pressure on and we you know, told the family what treatment options are there. Um, they did use those treatment options, and then the situation improved, including they did change the ventilator settings and they got his CO2 down, you know, just as we predicted. But you've got to ask the right questions, you know, and you also have to keep in mind if intensive care teams are not, um, you know, not using the right treatment approach, that it is potentially. Uh, that could be perceived as medical negligence and then you've got to draw your own conclusions you know but you also need to understand john coming back to your question originally <clears throat> about 90 percent of intensive care patients survive approximately 90 percent of intensive care patients survive so you've got to ask that question why should your family member be the one out of 10 not surviving so the odds are in your loved one's favor. 
okay? So that is really important for you to keep in mind. <clears throat> Again, no one is talking about quality of life, you know, that if your loved one is surviving, what does that quality of life look like? No one knows that, but that's not for the intensive care team to decide, that's for you to decide what is quality of life, what's acceptable for you and your family, what's acceptable for your loved one, you know. And uh, I do not agree with that nihilistic outlook of many intensive care units where they say and make the judgment of, well, you know, that person won't have any quality of life anyway. Who's to say that? So, um, okay, I hope that helps, John. Um, then let's go to the next question that we had this week. Um, my fiance is in ICU in a critically, critically induced coma. It's been almost 72 hours. I wasn't home when his collapse occurred, but I was told he went into cardiac arrest. He's 55 years old and he's had two previous heart attacks in the past. Can he survive? That's a great question. Look, um, if he's had two previous heart attacks and he's now had uh, another cardiac arrest, you know, my first question is, well, why did he have another cardiac arrest? Did he have cardiac surgery after this arrest? Did he have cardiac surgery after the last two heart attacks? What happened? You know, did he have, um, did he go to, um, to the catheter lab for an angiogram for an angioplasty? Did he have cardiac surgery? What's the treatment this time around? You know, again, has he been to cath lab? You know, has he had an angiogram, an angioplasty? Does he need cardiac surgery? Has he been referred to a cardiac surgeon? Um, so those are questions that need to be asked in a situation like this. You know, um, but it's very basic information that you're giving me here, Susan. And the reason I'm saying that is, you know, you've heard me say before, the biggest challenge for families in intensive care is that they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what to look for. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't know their rights and they don't know how to manage doctors and nurses in intensive care. And that's exactly the challenge that you are facing here. You know, when we work with clients one on one, we really need to either talk to the doctors and nurses directly to answer very specific ICU related questions or we need to look at medical records. Ideally, we do both. Ideally, we do both. So, um, you know, with what you're sharing with me here, Susan, it's not even 2% of the information I would need to know, me and my team would need to know to give you answers. You know, this is why intensive care, it's such a highly specialized area. You know, I'm talking about intensive care here all day long, but that's after over 20 years of experience. You know, your, your husband, uh, your fiance has only been in ICU for two days and, um, you know, it, it's, you're barely scratching the surface here, barely scratching the surface, you know. You know, other questions to ask Susan in a situation like that is, have they done cooling therapy, you know, which often happens after cardiac arrest. Has he sustained a brain injury from the cardiac arrest? How long did CPR take? How long was the quote unquote downtime? Was there loss of oxygen to the brain for more than three minutes? You know, those are questions to ask. In terms of the heart condition, what's his ejection fraction or the contractility of the heart? You know, is he potentially on a balloon pump? Is he on ECMO? You can see, you know, what are his blood results? What are his ventilator settings? What medication are they using for the induced coma? Is he on inotropes, vasopressors? You can see, I'm just scratching the surface here, but you need to ask all those questions. Hope that helps, Susan. Um, Another question we have this week is, 
My stepdad is currently in the ICU in the UK following surgery to remove huge stage four metastatic renal cell carcinoma is 55. He was diagnosed in November 2021. Operation was on the 15th of December 22 to remove the left kidney when the doctor were in there. They discovered the cancer had engulfed in the kidney, which was larger than a rugby ball, and they had to remove the spleen, part of the pancreas. Different doctors said half the main vein to the heart and some of the wall. When he came out of sedation, he was talking and doing well. Two days later, they were worried about fluid in the abdomen, which resulted in him being rushed back to theatre for a left hemicolectomy. At this point, he was very weak, but only a little oxygen on pain relief, and they introduced antibiotics. Three days on from what we were told, his pancreas was still leaking fluids and needed a scan. Then they decided it was best for them to go in and wash out the wound and look further into things. They discovered the right side of his bowel perforated and they had to take some away there as well. Now he's got sepsis and his remaining organs are starting to fail. The doctor wanted to stop support, but we said it has to be his choice, to which the doctor told my mother she doesn't have a choice. They will decide what to do. It's a medical decision. Today they have his breathing struggling and put him back on a ventilator with a view of theatre tomorrow for a tracheostomy so they can drain the fluid off his lungs because he's not strong enough to cough it up. But his heart rate has gone up and his blood pressure has gone down. I think the ventilator might have damaged his voice box from Wayne. Thanks, Wayne, for sending in your dad's or stepdad's situation. Um, now, if they are doing a tracheostomy and he is going to theatre for um, another um, surgery, you know, then I think they're doing all the right things. You know, in some jurisdictions, the doctors are, quote unquote, allowed to make medical decisions, but that shouldn't stop you from challenging it and shouldn't stop you from getting second opinions, you know. Um, but in this situation, when you're telling me they're taking him back for surgery, they're giving him a tracheostomy, you know, there's no indication for me that they're giving up. But you certainly have to watch the rhetoric that's coming from intensive care teams. And again, you have to be one step ahead of them and knowing what's coming and anticipate that, you know. So now with the sepsis and his remaining organs are failing, the trouble is he's got some form of abdominal sepsis probably and that is certainly always a challenge um, you know when when there's multiple organ failure to turn this around it can be turned around but it's often not a quick fix you know patients might stay in ICU for quite some time um, they may have difficulties getting off the ventilator you know um, and so it's certainly multiple abdominal surgeries, and it sounds to me like he's got drain in his tummy and so forth, that can be very difficult, you know. That can be very difficult. So you may have to brace yourself here for an, a prolonged ICU stay with an uncertain outcome, you know. They also think that the ventilator might have damaged his voice box. Yeah, you're probably right there, that prolonged intubation or a prolonged tracheostomy uh, will paralyze the vocal cords and um, that is certainly a challenge you know it also depends you know with your stepdad's stage four cancer you know has the cancer spread you know are there other metastases somewhere because that'll be another challenge Have they considered chemotherapy? You know. Um, also, with the left hemicolectomy, you know, he they would have removed large parts of the bowels, which is also a big challenge. You know. So with the um, with the sepsis, you know, they would need to treat the what I believe is an abdominal sepsis with probably strong antibiotics. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up on a dialysis machine, at least in the short term. 
like if he needs hemofiltration. But again, um, if they are doing a tracheostomy and they continue treating him, then I believe the doctor's words and his actions do not match. You know, as long as they keep treating him, you know, that's not necessarily, that's, a, that's probably a good thing, you know, because that's what you want, that's what your stepdad wants. And then again, you need to think about, do you want to take him home? You know, if he doesn't come off the ventilator, if he struggles coming off the ventilator, do you want to take him home, you know, with a service like intensive care? So you see what all of those situations have in common, as much as I would like to give everyone a quick fix, unfortunately, there is no quick fix. There's only a long-term approach. Long-term approach for you means you've got to do your research. You've got to anticipate what's coming next. You've got to manage the team there. You know, you've got to get someone on your team that can help you with anticipating the next steps. And we can do that here at Intensive Care Outline and Intensive Care at Home. You've got all your bases covered. Next, let's go to the next question. I hope that helps, Wayne. Hang on, where is the next question? There it is. So, this is from Brian. Brian says, thank you for your help and I apologize for not replying earlier. But we've had a very difficult time, especially over the last 10 days. Today is the seventh day that my wife has been free from a ventilator. However, this was not a simple and straightforward process. Early uh, on the 2nd of January, my wife on a ventilator on CPAP mode. This was then changed to a bivent level or a BiPAP level. On the 5th of January, we had a call to advise that my wife was dying. CO2 was building up and the team had to hand pump to get sufficient oxygen into my wife as the ventilator would not go to the pressures needed. This at the time was apparently an unsustainable situation. So the ICU consultants advised the only way forward was to let my wife pass away by switching off the ventilator. This was done and we waited and waited. She's still here. The two primary senior respiratory consultants are baffled Currently, she's once again receiving saline oxygen and is being fed by a nasogastric tube. The situation is very fragile. What do you think is happening? Well, I can think, I can tell you what I think is happening here, Brian. I remember talking to you a couple of weeks ago. There's two things happening here. I see you, the ICU team here is ex extremely negative. Um, they were anticipating the worst case scenario from their end if they kept your mum, if, if they kept treating your wife. What's the worst case scenario for an intensive care unit? Worst case scenario for an intensive care unit is to have a long-term patient in there looking after someone long-term with um, an um, uncertain outcome. Your wife clearly uh, fitted that picture um, from memory when I spoke to you on the phone a couple of weeks ago. So now, um, and I know you're in the UK, Brian, and I know in the UK, you know, at the moment what's happening there is really terrible because we have a number of clients in the UK and we can see the push towards end of life in most ICUs where we work with clients. It's terrible. I do believe that the NHS has lost all moral and ethical grounds for patients and families in ICU. You know, and I'm well aware that there's a lot of good things happening in ICU, but because with the work that I'm doing and we are doing, you know, we see a lot of negatives and we see that nihilistic um, approach from intensive care teams, again, saying, you know, it's quote unquote, in the best interest of someone to die. Well, unless someone has said they want to die, it's not in their best interest. You know, life is worth living, even if people are on a ventilator, you know, ask our clients at intensive care on whether they want to be dead or they want to be alive. Well, they all want to be alive. Right. So um, now, coming back to your situation, Brian, though, it tells me once again that intensive care teams are very poor predictors of the future. You know, sometimes we have clients approaching us in similar situations where they say, well, I see you saying, you know, we need to stop life support. And then my wife, my 
husband, my child, my, you know, parent, whatever is going to die. And I said, well, how do you know? And that's what I would have said to you if you had contacted me there. And then I would have said to you, well, how do they know that your dad is going to die? Uh, your wife, I'm sorry. How do they know? Do they have a crystal ball? Clearly not. Clearly not. This is all about positioning your wife in a negative way. You know, again, what if you have, if you would have pushed for intensive care at home, for example? You know, this would have never happened in the first place. You got to get informed, Brian, here and take matters in your own hands. Do the research, know what your options are. You know, I would never agree to end of life unless the person wants to. You know, we all want to live. So, you know, and given that it is still alive, again, their predictions were very poor. So now what happens if your wife is deteriorating? She probably needs to go back on a ventilator. You know, she should have, she should have probably never been taken off a ventilator in the first place. If the ventilator was not getting the pressure that was needed, could she have benefited from ECMO? I don't know. I don't have all the information. It's a little bit of speculation here from my end, but you know, you should ask the question. What would have been other treatment options? You didn't ask the question at the time, what are other treatment options? Maybe ECMO would have been one of them. Again, it comes back that families in intensive care don't know what they don't know. They don't know what to look for. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't know their rights and they don't know how to manage doctors and nurses in intensive care. And that's exactly what's happening here, Brian. You know, you got to read between the lines in ICU. Now they've cut off your options um, for your wife to have advanced treatment. I'm sure you didn't want that, you know. So again, this is hopefully also a warning for other families in intensive care that you need to think ahead. You know, you can't just give in because that's what, especially in the UK at the moment in ICUs is happening. You know, a lot of patients die because ICUs are withdrawing treatment prematurely or even worse, they are withholding treatment. And unless families work with us, they don't even know that the NHS is withholding treatment. You know, um, because we can see what's happening. So I hope that helps, Brian. Let's answer one more question and then we're going to wrap this up today. And this is from Cocaine. Cocaine says, our dad went into hospital for an operation on a fractured thigh. The doctors were giving anesthesia and during surgery he had a cardiac arrest because he had a thrombosis. They're saying had, my dad had six times, uh, had six cardiac arrests during that period. They always brought him back. Since then he's been on a ventilator. Doctor did an MRI on the very next day. Um, the brain was looking normal but there is no clinical improvement after day seven they did again another mri and they said there is now severe hypoxic ischemic brain injury and they they're saying that my dad will remain in a permanently in a permanent vegetative state but as time passes on day 15 my dad opened his eyes no pupil movements yet um, but he's also now moving his leg the doctors are saying you can withdraw life support as there is not any good hope for any further recovery. Please help me and guide. Sure. Cocaine, again, you know, similar to the other situations that I've just mentioned now, you should not give up if you don't feel like giving up. You should put yourself in your dad's shoes and, and find out what he would want. If you think he would want it to continue, continue. If you think your dad wants not to continue, then you should probably look into that. But you shouldn't make any rush decisions one way or another. So one way that I always say is, you know, when families say, well, what decision should we be making? It's quite simple. You should be making decisions today that you don't regret in a year's time. That's how you should make decisions. Imagine you're making a decision today that you want to withdraw life support today. Would you regret that in a year's time? 
Don't think about tomorrow. Don't think about the next day. Think about a year's time because we have many families coming to us saying, oh, last year I decided that it's right, quote unquote, right to withdraw treatment on my dad. And now I regret it because I think, did I kill my dad? And they're having second thoughts. And you're in the very same shoes here. You know, now if you are saying that they are saying your dad is in a vegetative state, well, if he's already opening eyes and moving his legs, what are the next steps? Is it likely for him to go backwards? Is it likely for him to move forward? I don't know. I don't know. But, um, you know, um, you need to think about what's possible again, coming back to intensive care at home. Can you take him home, you know, with ICU nurses and replicate the ICU bed at home? Most likely by what you're sharing with me. I think that is an option. Assuming it's not on, is medically stable. You haven't shared anything. So I think that that is your next step, looking at home care. Okay, so it's quite simple. Simple, but not easy. And again, like to everyone that's watching this, you know, I have solutions, but I don't have a quick fix. You know, we have solutions, but no quick fix. Okay. Um, Again, I just want to remind you, you can type your questions into the chat pad or you can dial in live on the show if you have any questions on the numbers that I put in the chat pad. So, okay, now. Okay, if there are no other questions, then I want to slowly wrap this up. Maybe we'll just do one more. Um, one more question that came in this week. From Tracy, Tracy writes, so they're trying to give my dad a tracheostomy and he has mechanical ventilation. He yawned yesterday, which is something he hasn't done before and he moves when I'm there, his eyes and stuff. And hence, when I start praying for him, he's really trying to fight and get better. I don't think another surgery is the way to go. As to me, it's just tired, but he's more active and awake. As the days go by, please, may I have some advice. They're trying to wean him off the ventilator. Is this the right thing to do? I'll just answer that part of the question because there's more to come. Is it the right thing to wean him off the ventilator? Absolutely. If they can avoid the tracheostomy, they should. You know, the goal should always be to wean someone off a ventilator and the breathing tube full stop. That should be the number one goal. There should be no talk about tracheostomy. Once they've done everything beyond the shadow of a doubt to try and wean your dad off the ventilator with a breathing tube and it's not working for whatever reason, then you can look at a tracheostomy. So weaning him off the ventilator is the right step 100% to avoid the tracheostomy. Okay, then your question goes on. They said they won't do anything without our consent and there's risks to still being on mechanical ventilation, but the risks to me sound better than getting another invasive surgery and being out under a sedation again. He's stable, but he's had brain surgery. And that takes some time to heal. They're saying we should do it to get him into a rehabilitation. I just hope and don't know if we should let risks scare us into getting this surgery. Okay. And that is from Tracy. Tracy, great question. Um, and thanks for writing in. Um, again, if he can't be weaned off the ventilator with a breathing tube, he absolutely should have a tracheostomy. The risk of him staying on a breathing tube is higher if he can't be weaned off the ventilator than it is to get a tracheostomy. Because if he stays on a breathing tube most of the time, he needs to um, have, an, he needs to be in an induced coma. And the longer he's in an induced coma, the more He's got muscle wastage, he's getting deconditioned. You know, once he's got the tracheostomy, they can wake him up, hopefully mobilize him, hopefully start with more physical therapy. So the risk of him staying in an induced coma and the breathing tube is much higher than doing a tracheostomy, assuming he's not waking up and he's not ready to be taken off the breathing tube. The cutoff is about two weeks. You know, you shouldn't have someone on a breathing tube uh, for more than two weeks before you're doing a tracheostomy. I hope that helps Tracy answering that question. 
And yes, tracheostomy is invasive surgery, absolutely. But keeping them on a breathing tube and in an induced coma is doing more damage than having them do a tracheostomy. Again, that's assuming he can't be weaned off the ventilator and he can't be weaned off the breathing tube, right? Um, another thing that you need to consider is with a brain surgery, you haven't shared whether your dad is awake or whether he's not awake. You know, the more awake he is, the higher chances he can get off the ventilator. The more asleep he is, chances are lowering of him getting off the ventilator at least quickly, then a tracheostomy would probably be the right next step. I hope that helps Tracy. Okay, so I want to wrap this up today, unless there are any other questions. Um, you know, type your questions into the chat pad or you can call me directly on one of the numbers on the top of, or on, on one of the numbers on that I typed into the chat pad. If there are no further questions, you know, um, I would really appreciate if you give this video a like, give it a thumbs up. I would appreciate if you subscribe to my YouTube channel for regular updates for families in intensive care. I would appreciate if you click the notification bell and share the video with your friends and families who have families in intensive care, family members in intensive care to get the help they need. Um, furthermore, um, if you have a loved one in intensive care, go to intensivecareathome.com, especially if you are looking for home care, go to intensivecareathome.com. We can help you with home care for your loved one with tracheostomy and ventilation, also with BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation, CPAP. We do home TPN. Um, we do any clients at home that are in need of an intensive care nurse. We even have clients that are sometimes not ventilated, but they have other very complex clinical conditions and they would be in intensive care otherwise. So we can help you with that. Um, and if you need consulting and advocacy in intensive care, if you need questions answered for uh, intensive care related subjects, when you have a loved one in intensive care, go to intensivecarehotline.com call us on one of the numbers on the top of our website or simply email us to support at intensivecarehotline.com. Please also check out our membership for families in intensive care at intensivecaresupport.org. There you have access to me and my team 24 hours a day in the membership area and via email and we answer all questions intensive care and intensive, intensive care and intensive care at home related. We also offer medical record reviews for our clients in intensive care, we do medical records, record reviews. Um, while your loved one is in intensive care and also after intensive care, especially if you are um, concerned about medical negligence, but it's so much better if we can review them in real time because um, in real time, we can give you real time feedback and we can ask the right questions to the doctors and the nurses in real time. Okay. Um, so that's it for today. I'll do another live stream next week again, 10.30 a.m. Sydney, Melbourne time. That is um, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on a Saturday night, which is 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. I'm looking forward to catch you here. Have a look at our the quick tip videos that are published during the week. I'm looking forward to engaging with you again. And again, if you need intensive care at home, have a look at intensivecareathome.com and contact us through the website or call us on one of the numbers on the top of our website. Take care for now. I appreciate your support. Take care.